Mantra launch, uh, and it was a privilege to be there yesterday, and equally it is a privilege to be here today, and more particularly uh, given the fact of uh, this extremely high part panel, uh, which I'm supposed to be moderating this discussion on financial inclusion, the unrealized dream. Uh, just a quick introduction, everybody does know, uh, I'm sure by reputation, most of the panelists, but nonetheless, very, very briefly. On my right, uh, Vijay, uh, who is in fact, if anything, my microfinance guru. And uh, uh, yesterday, I understand he was given one more lifetime award. So congratulations, Vijay. Mm -hmm. Then again on the right, uh, a friend, uh, Ganesh Rangaswamy, mm -hmm. with Axion. Uh, on my left, uh, Manoj Nambiar, uh, a friend and a colleague on the MPIN board. Uh, after that, uh, Tamal, uh, whom all of you I'm sure know by reputation. I have a suspicion that uh, the organizers have made a slight mistake. Normally he moderates. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I do have a challenge in terms of trying to do anything re remotely as good as, as he does. And finally, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Ajay Kapoor, he is the chief general manager with SIDBI. Uh, again, somebody who's been very passionately involved with uh, uh, microfinance, with financial inclusion. So once again, thank you everybody and uh, great to see uh, everybody in the room. Uh, it is not the job of the moderator to talk very much, so therefore I shall just say a couple of sentences and uh, then uh, with folks on my right and left, uh, move on. Uh, we, we do seem to be uh, at an extremely interesting stage of uh, this financial inclusion narrative in this country. I mean, forever it has been always about, uh, oh my God, nothing is happening, uh, and nothing will happen for a long, long time. Hmm. Now, what we find is, uh, is a change of that narrative. Huh? Uh, you hear people saying, oh, with the PMJDY, uh, oh, 140 million accounts have been, have been opened and therefore isn't it uh, no longer a case of uh, financial inclusion being in large measure realized? If anything, the, 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 the conversations are around, should we move from this earlier context of banking the unbanked to the new context of funding the unfunded? Yesterday's mudra was very much about funding the unfunded. The other big overall development has been in the context of the architecture for financial inclusion. Uh, there have been, I think, uh, over the past uh, 12, 18 months, uh, much more which has taken place than maybe in the previous uh, 12, 18 years. Uh, we have the small finance banks uh, getting into place. Uh, we, of course, have two new banks with, uh, at least on paper, a bias towards financial inclusion. Uh, we've had uh, this very successful PMJDVI. We have now the Mudra launch yesterday. So really out there, uh, a whole bunch of new organizations uh, focused primarily on the financial inclusion agenda. And uh, hopefully tomorrow and day after will look much better than the past many, many decades. Uh, with that, I'll close. And what I would request is uh, for each of the speakers to briefly make a maybe a five minute uh, opening comment. And with that, then we can get into a more conversational format. So Vijay, you as uh, pretty much uh, the founding father of the microfinance movement in India, your thoughts now on how are things looking compared to all that you've been through over the past uh, two decades? Well, look, both <coughs> you and I were at the second January, uh, second uh, April event in uh, Bombay, the Reserve Bank of India's 80th anniversary, and where the Honorable Prime Minister and Finance Minister were there. <coughs> and uh, the Prime Minister made a very powerful speech, and uh, I think in about 20 minutes, summarized more eloquently, more powerfully, and more pragmatically what I've been trying to argue for 20 years. So, uh, and I'm not a great fan of the gentleman. So, so I'm saying this as genuinely and an and admiration, at least to that speech. So, um, <clears throat> so listening to that, the first reaction was, 
wow, man. Now you can truly retire. It's been mainstreamed. You know, the PM himself is talking about it. Everybody is saying financial inclusion, financial inclusion. It's 80th anniversary. The RBI is celebrating with financial inclusion as a theme. What more do you want? Go home. And then <clears throat> the other half of me is saying, hey, all your life you cribbed that the policy regime was not friendly. Now that it's getting friendly, go out and do something. You know, this is the time to actually plunge into action. And when you think about it, you know, in the morning there was a session on uh, public health, which I, where I was interviewing Dr. Ramanan on, you know, polio eradication and thereafter. And so while polio has been eradicated, they've now adopted Project Indra Dhanush to take, you know, immunize children against seven diseases. And I think we should f take a leave from that. And while bank accounts have been opened, and let's take this at face value, although there'll be some holes in those numbers, but looks like n some 90% plus of India's population has now got bank accounts. But let's take it to the project in the Dhanush. So savings, credit, insurance, pensions, payments and remittances, five, plus none of these take care of inflation, which is an abiding reality of our lives. And therefore, why should there not be access to mutual funds for poor people? And finally, because agriculture is still the most important uh, livelihood in the country in terms of numbers, not share of the GDP. So <clears throat> derivatives, but at the micro level. Today, the average derivative on our commodity exchange is 20 tons. The average Indian farmer produces two tons. So we need to have derivatives available at the size of one ton. So there's enough for us to do in the world of microfinance if we define microfinance in the Indradhanush way rather than in the old style polio eradication way. Now if you drill deep further into any one of these, whether it is credit itself, uh, Manoj corrected me in one of the previous sessions, I was being kind to the industry and saying 75% of the industry is, uh, you know, basically sing still doing a single product, the, the Grameen style weekly loan, and uh, somebody said, no, it's 95%. Whatever it is, we are still a very uni-product microcredit industry. We don't take care of a large number of, uh, you know, either livelihood needs or life cycle needs. In insurance, the offering is very, very minimal. Uh, in, <clears throat> uh, you know, savings, it is basically, okay, if you've got money, you can come and save, but you know, some of the more uh, uh, low ticket user friendly services like doorstep collection or commitment savings, those kind of products are not yet available the way they are available in Indonesia, for example. So what I'm saying is both in terms of breadth and depth, there's a lot to do, and we should take the prime minister's endorsement of this field as a starting point and not the ending point. So it's, so Lifetime Achievement Award is not, it, it should be continue to work the rest of your lifetime. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Vijay. Uh, Tamal, uh, you've been uh, a, a commentator in the public space uh, for a while and have been writing extensively on financial inclusion issues. What is your take on this? I mean, do you think the architecture is now there pretty much and we've got a, a whole new level of traction out there on the ground? Yeah. Thank you, Alok. Uh, I have a slightly different take. Uh, you know, apparently, there are a lot of things have happened in the past one year, uh, starting with the two new banks, uh, because the basic idea behind giving license to uh, IDFC and Bandhan is uh, expansion of uh, banking to the uh, to various parts of the country or the so-called financial inclusion. So that's how it started. Then you have we had seen that uh, prime ministers. Uh, the much talked about Yojana, which got 140 million <coughs> new depositors in banking system. Then you have RBI asking for applications for uh, and some 125 applicants rushing for payment banks and small banks. And now you have Mudra. Uh, 
but I, I, I'm not very sure how much of it is noise. Uh, by no means I want to belittle the efforts, but I think too much of this is noise than uh, what exactly is happening on the ground reality. Let me give you an anecdote. Uh, last August, uh, when this PMJDRY was launched officially from this uh, in this venue, I happened to be in Kolkata and uh, I was told there is a function uh, attended by one of the ministers, central ministers, where uh, you know, essentially the, the message of PMJDRY will be conveyed to people and some people will give their kit at uh, the depositor, introducing them to Indian banking. So there's a big screen uh, where uh, they were actually telecasting what was happening in Vigyan Bhavan. And then after that, I found about a dozen people uh, <coughs> coming in and the minister was handing over uh, a deposit kit uh, to each of them. And later I figured out I uh, spoke to at least two of them. One of them is the driver of uh, local bank's deputy general manager, which is his third account. Another person is the driver of a general manager of a bank, local bank, and for him is the second account. Uh, so I confronted, if I may use the word, to this uh, general manager and deputy general manager, just how are you doing this? You are making a mockery of this. This supposed to be unbanked people should be coming. And this gentleman said that, oh, how do you get unbanked people? Do I go and look around, oh, are you an unbanked and all? It's better to get my driver to get this thing done and all. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's a lot of noise is being created on this. I, I, noise, is imp noise is important, noise is good. Uh, I'm no way I'm saying that it is bad because you know this will put pressure on the system to do some work. But there's a lot of confusion also. For instance, if Indeed, we have got 14 crore, 140 million people under the banking fold, and we have got about 90% of Indians are banked now. Why do you need 20 years to be fully banked? Our Prime Minister on 2nd April in Mumbai said that today is 80 years of Reserve Bank of India's um, uh, no, completed 80 years, and we want India to be fully banked by when Reserve Bank of India is 100 years. So he himself is giving a long road 20 years. So there's a lot of confusion. If we have actually gone so much ahead of for, un, for this, I mean, or towards financial inclusion, why do you need 20 years more? So I think we also, in our heart of hearts, our politicians, our minister know that, you know, there's a lot of noise, actual ground, literally slightly different. And uh, similar thing about Mudra Bank, I would say. It, Mudra Bank reminds me of Women's Bank, uh, which was uh, announced by former uh, finance minister, Mr. Chidambaram. And you look at what Women's Bank has done. Where is it? Has it served its purpose? No. Instead of asking the existing banking system, you allocate 5% of your branches uh, for women only. Uh, so that uh, 1 lakh plus, uh, 1 lakh uh, 10,000 branches out of which is get ready-made, uh, 6, uh, 6, 7, 8,000 branches for women. Instead of doing that, you want to score a political point that I have got a, I have got a bank for women. And what happened to the bank for women? How many women have actually got, uh, uh, you know, covered by that bank? So my, uh, similarly, I would think Mudra also, I'm sorry, nobody would like me to say this, but Mudra also, I would say the same thing. You have a refinance agency like be you have a refinance agency like Nabad, you want to have another, yet another refinance agency, Mudra, and you want to become also the regulator. There's a lot of confusion. What will Reserve Bank of India do? Do you need actually, uh, again, I know what happened to NHB? What has it done for housing finance? So I'm not very sure about the f future of Mudra Bank. Had it been like, say, something like what in Bangladesh, you have Pali Karma Sahayak Foundation, PKSF, which not only does refinance, but takes care of the entire thing, you know, uh, identifying the beneficiaries to training them, everything from A to Z it does. But what will, uh, what will Mudra Bank do? And when globally shadow banking is a suspect, and when your banking regulator is ready to give uh, license to small banks, which will take the banking, uh, you know, uh, to the hinterland of India and all. So rather I would pitch for hundreds and thousands of small banks than having a mudra bank uh, which, is a, uh, which is a bundle of confusion, what is it going to do? So to sum it, I think there are a lot of efforts have been happening uh, in the past one year, both by the regulator as well as uh, the um, uh, government. I think quite a few of them are working at cross purposes. 
and uh, as a result of this lot of noise has been created yes noise is good that would put pressure uh, on the system uh, to do the work but we need to see and um, wait to what extent the ground reality changes thank you uh, thanks uh, you have been true to form controversial and exciting both and stirred the pot quite a bit now with that let me request uh, ajay from sidbi mr kapoor uh, he too has been very closely in, involved with mudra for that matter and i'm sure many points uh, of the let us say criticism or issues raised by tamal uh, i'm sure ajay you could uh, respond to and of course uh, more fundamentally i think uh, sidbi has been uh, so deeply engaged with the microfinance industry uh, from early days and uh, has a very i would say uh, deep understanding of how the industry has taken shape where it stands today and therefore in the larger scheme of things how would you see things progressing as we as we look ahead uh thanks alok uh, let me at the beginning say that i am an outsider to microfinance in sidbi i have never handled microfinance function but having said that uh, i am within sidbi have been very very actively from 93 onwards uh, been very close to the teams working and have been always part of you know the, the stirring of pot thing which is happening here uh, because uh, uh, sidbi when it was created in 1990 as a refinancing agency had the same you know description that how do you refinance without state support and uh, in a liberalized economy refinance should actually have no real, no role to play and here now we have an agency which has refinance boldly written in its name uh incidentally we were rio myself and mr manny about uh, you know 6 months back on a global uh, discussion on the role of dfis uh, as you all aware that role of dfis has come back in focus post you know 2007 8 by down and it was very interesting to hear the discussions because it was economists presenting cases for for let's say bnds brazil nafinza cdb china development bank and so on luckily for us sidbi was not a case study there but we did become a case study because we were present so we spoke and uh, interesting thing was that uh, most economists agree that it's not the state which makes a difference here it's the dfis which make a difference so so evaluation showed that china development bank interestingly without any state support had done much better than uh, other sme uh, you know development banks in including uh, bdc canada which ha which has all its borrowings coming from central bank so the model for state support varies but there are uh, good examples where just the good programs are able to you know make quick growth so to make the long point short mudra will make a difference through what it does not through how it is positioned uh when we started off in 1990 uh, i think mr bridge mohan dr shailendra narayan they they took their time understanding and it was very much a volunteer driven you know it, it wasn't even a business i think a movement i would say where we were trying to emulate so 1993 was the first time when i went for a four week program called finance uh, you know for for micro enterprises in in cranford where a number of intermediaries and uh, funny thing is that uh, uh, if we look back most of the other countries which participated today are great laggards compared to india so uh, i i think uh, sidbi could stay things a bit here in that period of time but we back in 2000 we realized that in time to come this could be you know uh, this could be uh, asking for more attention on its own right uh, when in 1990 i was receiving my farewell from my project finance department idbi so one of my colleagues remarked are tum kahi bhi dal dete ho application and uh, you you going for a small bank what is it you going to do there so kal ko tidbi banega because at that time we had the concept of tiny units so he said it's going to be next tidbi and you're going to apply there and be there i said very much so 
I said, I don't see making any difference to the large companies whom we fund here. <coughs> we, we learn from them rather than we make a difference to them. So uh, uh, when you create out of a large DFI, another one which is exclusively looking at one segment of it, so I think there's going to be sharper focus. Uh, so when we separated from SIGBI, uh, well, we were doing uh, many of the things which we're doing in IDBI. We took over the same things. It provided continuity. But we had to make our presence felt and do many more things. And here, we are going to be driven. I mean, unlike uh, 1990, when it was like a, you know, often like situation that suddenly you, 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 you're chasing liberalization and you're actually having a, a situation where banks were directed towards market, uh, you know, uh, based pricing mechanisms and all. So here, on the other hand, we want to see uh, that the social change happens faster, the, the inequity gets addressed quicker way. So I, I guess it's not a design which is made beforehand when a DFI is created, but rather to see that, uh, you know, uh, 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 that you, you pick people who have some development ban banking experience. So we have, we are happy that Actually, now uh, the CEO has been chosen. He comes from Nabard. So we all know that we, we have two streams of uh, you know microfinancing in the country, and both have their pluses and minuses, and both have worked together. And if I see in last you know 18 months, SIGBI and Nabard have been coming together as such at uh, 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 to see uh, you know to see divergence of views being actually used to strengthen each other models. Uh, so I see that uh, there's a possibility of few things which we piece together, which we gave in the, because we had to work for almost, you know, almost a month, very hard to have some sketches ready. Uh, the sketches were deeper than what appears in, in, what, in the handouts, handouts we got, but uh, I think uh, rightfully so, uh, the, the, the secretary said that let the board be in place, and uh, I think you are also part of one of the core groups on, on Mudra. So it will be interesting to see what difference we can make. It's, uh, uh, it's good to have uh, optimism and it's good to have skepticism, both working together, it keeps you on toes. So I'm, I'm sure that what Mr. Bandabhadeh has said is, is uh, something of a sounding board for anybody who's going to work on new things. Uh, change is very difficult to make and you, you know, because I come from a capital background too, but at the same time we know that if out of 500 ventures we start out, five do go out and make a difference to the world. Sure. So, so let's hope that uh, something good comes from it. Uh, thanks, Ajay. And uh, yes, you're right. Uh, certainly, I think, uh, if nothing else, uh, the sharper focus uh, which Mudra will bring to that segment uh, ought to make a difference. Uh, Manoj, uh, you've been in the microfinance space for a while, and alongside uh, uh, Arun is also an applicant uh, for the small finance bank. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, that is pretty much being seen as the as the future uh, for everybody. Tamal did talk about how all these non-bank shadow banks, uh, all these ghostly characters, uh, are are things which people are not so comfortable with, and hence uh, to be a, a, a legit bank is what everybody aspires for. Your thoughts on the way things are looking as we move ahead with this architecture of the small finance bank. Oh, thanks, Alok. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming to me second last. Normally, I mean, normally you, when you reach the practitioner last. <laughs> right, so I should thank you for that. Uh, having heard my uh, previous speaker speak, I think it's been a mix of uh, optimism, a mix of sort of realism, and, I mean, and some amount of pessimism in terms of what's happening on the ground. I would really say that uh, having been in the sector now for about five years, the kind of changes which have happened in the last, I would say, two to three years, really make one very, very uh, happy and excited. And I, I mean, I keep saying to my team back in Arohan that, I mean, if at all there's a time to be in India, it's today. And if at all there's a time to be in financial inclusion, it's actually today. So, I mean, I was just jotting down some of the uh, key changes which have happened in the last uh, almost two to uh, three years, starting right from the NBFC MFI creation after the AP crisis, uh, the sector coming together and creating the credit bureau and, and the sort of code of conduct in terms of how institutions would operate. Uh, MFIN being, I mean, being I mean, actually recognized as the SRO, which is the first really SRO in terms of the financial services sector. Uh, 
in terms of the universal banking license, one of us, uh, which is the biggest MFI in the country, getting getting an in principle license to be the, I um, mean to be one of the two uh, universal banks, the small finance bank guidelines, and then of course the entire uh, process of application, uh, Mudra, which has just been launched in the same platform here as today. Uh, so I think uh, when I look back, I, I, I really see uh, progress having made on two, three fronts. One is on the macro side. Uh, we, we've kept talking earlier about the fact that not more than 30, 35% of our adult eligible Indian population has access to a bank account. And today I believe that figure has almost reached 57, 58%, which I think is, uh, is actually a dramatic improvement from 34 that it used to be earlier. We also used to talk about the fact that hardly four or five percent of the credit uh, to uh, businesses actually come from the formal sector. That number, I, I mean, I believe has actually gone to 14 percent. So probably there is some thought behind why banking the unbanked is today suddenly become uh, funding the unfunded, right? We all have been mentioning this earlier in terms of MFIs that credit is really that first uh, uh, helping hand which is really required to actually start a relationship. And after that, there are so many things that you can actually help the customer with. Uh, so I would say that I, I'm, I'm very excited to be in the sector, and I think uh, the IntelliCap group with, with the three NBFCs that we have has been one of the applicants for the SFB. We think, like, I mean, like Tamalda mentioned, that that is really the right architecture for the Indian context given the kind of financial exclusion, if I were to say, in the, in the semi-urban and the rural sector. And uh, let's see, I mean, I only hope that the whole exercise doesn't become a token gesture in just some two or three people being, being given the initial license. I really hope uh, and pray that uh, sort of better sense will prevail. Uh, may not be thousands and lakhs like, uh, I mean, like Tamalda mentioned, but at least, at least the number to be in sort of higher double digits so that uh, the, the whole hypothesis can be tested out properly, and then over a period of time, obviously, make the whole thing on tap. Right? So I, 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 mean, I really remain uh, optimistic about the future and believe that uh, we are progressing gradually towards a full financial inclusion kind of model. There are, I mean, there are anomalies in the number of accounts which have opened. There are anomalies in terms of overlapping. There are anomalies in terms of what definitions are used. But I think all this is rights of passage, right? So as long as we are making incremental progress and the sort of destination is very clear, I'm sure it's a positive move to do. Uh, thanks, uh, <coughs> Manoj. And yes, I think uh, certainly very, very exciting times. And Ganesh, uh, you know, uh, with Axion uh, and all the stuff which Axion has seen and done uh, across the world, uh, with that kind of uh, perspective, uh, how would you compare the Indian situation today with the way things have moved globally? And uh, would you agree with uh, Manoj, uh, his comment about uh, that we are now progressing very well towards a full financial inclusion model? Sure, thanks, Alok. And uh, I was just going to respond to what Manoj said, where Alok uh, aptly kept the investor for the, for the end <laughs> and gave practitioners that due, due right, which is the way it should be done. And he's also <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he's also on my board, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not disclose secrets here. The investor has the last word. <laughs> yeah, in any case, yeah. <laughs> not so fast. So, so just to set context to what, uh, you know, the question Alok is asking, of course, Axion is an institution that has been doing financial inclusion for 60 years, I guess, uh, and clearly I'm not, I've not been around for that long. Uh, but we literally discovered what the word is around a lot of geographies, which has helped the institution understand how, how it evolves in various parts of the uh, world and so much of cultural context, how relevant is so much of cultural context to it. And we have different parts. I represent uh, the, uh, the frontier investment groups at Axion, which is primarily you know, uh, um, basically investing uh, uh, sig significant amounts, ABC, um, um, uh, growth, growth capital in uh, financial inclusion opportunities. And the geographies, uh, primarily we look at, of course, Latin America, Africa, and India is the beachhead in Asia. So with that context, um, you know, uh, coming to your question, I think uh, uh, there are two or three things that, that I'd point out, and maybe to start with, I would uh, second a few things which uh, Tamil uh, started with and agree with a couple of things which Mr. Kapoor said uh, in terms of 
uh, when you try new things, there are always uh, failures you have to be prepared for, and there will always be challenges, and there will always be naysayers. Uh, so, so if we take it in that context, I think we'll certainly come across those challenges. Uh, they will certainly come across uh, uh, issues and uh, you know solutions to hurdles we have to overcome. Uh, second, but on the on the point of, um, but I, I would I would admit that I think a great point was raised on NHP. Uh, without elaborating a lot on it, and as an investor, I'm, I'm careful what I say, I would very much support uh, what Mr. Bandhapadhyay said. And it's a question we have to ask for every institution we create. And to that extent, honestly, one of the questions I've been asking all microfinance institutions is as a small, small finance bank, uh, do, we have an, do we have an appreciation? And, and you know, on this panel, we have enough people who have a lot more appreciation than me. But do we have enough appreciation for the regulatory and compliance challenges we have to deal with once we are a bank? Do we know how we are going to take care of the medium term funding situation? Once we become a bank, we are not going to have deposits right away, but our banking partners will look at us in a new light. So these are, I think, fundamental uh, questions which I think all of us have been asking. But uh, I think there is also a, a drive in our country usually to get a license. Right? And, and for some it makes sense, for a lot it pro probably doesn't. But I think that's something we all have to sort out for ourselves. But having said all of that, I would say we have, I have been personally amazed by the, what we have seen in the last 12 months in India uh, in terms of the evolution on multiple fronts. One is not just regulation, but I think even in terms of appreciation of understanding financial inclusion in a broader spectrum, like understanding that it's not, it's credit, yes, but also, mo, uh, you know, to the point that Vijay was uh, making, holistic credit, it's not just microfinance in the uh, uh, early sense that we used to, uh, early days, the sense in which we used to understand microfinance, but broader suite of alternate products. Uh, and, you know, we are heavily invested in housing, housing finance, education finance, SME financing in the country. Uh, the second dimension is we are starting to see a lot more progress, pro progress in terms of ability to work with banks. That's a tremendous practical change on the ground, which I think, uh, I mean, again, all of us have seen this for a while. I think in the last 10 years, we have never seen it like this. The third is there is also a lot more appreciation now for data and how to use that data to understand customers better. I still think it will take time for that to really, you know, become 100% in practice. But I think we are starting to see a lot more appreciation for data and in terms of understanding customers better to figure out what kind of a product makes sense for which customer. And, uh, you know, and overall, just a uh, just couple of final uh, comments. We always used to say, in a, in a very ironical way, combining data, analytics, technology, and payment platforms, especially with the advent of smartphones. In fact, I was just talking to somebody. We are adding 9 million smartphones a month. I don't know a country in the world which is doing that. You know, we don't know the numbers out of China, the perfect numbers, but there's no other country in the world which is doing that. And uh, this is in the hands of people we would never imagine. So things are changing in a dramatic way from a regulatory, from a macro, and from an entrepreneurial perspective, which is great. Two years back, I think we, even though we, we, we produced a lot of innovative stuff in the country, we used to look towards some of the Latin American markets, or even Kenya for that matter, for some of the newer innovations that have been adopted at scale. That's changing. Even in two years, that's changing, which I think is a fairly short time frame for to see a change like this. So I think we are quite excited, while obviously challenging some of the things which should be challenged. Uh, thanks, Ganesh. And uh, I get back to the second round now with uh, Vijay, as always, uh, in the front, <laughs> leading the charge. Uh, Vijay, you've been a policy buff and a contributor uh, to policy pretty much forever. Uh, as you see things today, uh, what are the three things or three big things you would want to see at the policy level? Well, the first thing I'd like to see is, uh, you know, a significant reduction in the delay between near consensus about a new uh, you know, new dispensation versus it actually happening. I mean, just to mention to you, we've, we just inaugurated the Mudra Bank, but the first mention of a bank for the informal sector was done in the Shram Shakti report, which came out in 1993. Ilaben was planning commission member at that time. 
It was repeated in 2006 by the Arjun Sengupta Commission on National, you know, <coughs> the first attempt to make small financial banks, small finance banks was done by us in 1995. It led to the birth of local area banks, but then the policy was stymied for five years, and then eventually only four local area banks were established. So non-starter, basically. The first business correspondent uh, discussion was the Khan Committee, 2006, and it's only now that the BC regime has finally reached where it should have. So, you know, this delay is unconscionable. You know, it's, what it does is, this is, this is what is withholding our GDP from 9% to 6%. It, this is the friction at the top which is causing the rest of the economy to slow down or become informal or even illegal, you know. So, <clears throat> so that's one, one thing that needs to be done. That, and the, how can that be changed? Sorry for the interruption, Vijay, yeah. but don't you think, uh, and from what other panelists have said, that that is exactly what seems to be changing today? No, so it's, it, that's very exciting mm -hmm. and that's, I think, because of you know, certain very good people in certain very good positions. But that's what I, while we should celebrate that that's happening, it's not a systemic solution. Right. You know, what I'm looking for is that policy making is too serious to be left to government. We must understand that government is just one player in policy making and that it's the, the other stakeholders whose voices must be heard and on a continuous basis. And the government's job is to be a good listener and then a good broker of com competing interests, you know, in a, in a democratic way, rather than be the arbiter of what, you know, what is the current secretary's whim or the current governor's whim, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one. So one is just the delay issue. The second is, I think, intersectoral integration. Once again, the PMJDY is an example of, there's nothing in PMJDY which did not exist during UPA2. We already had a nationwide movement to financial inclusion. We already had core banking system. We already had uh, Aadhaar. We already had telecom linkages with all of this. What we didn't have is a unified command control system, which made it into a mission. You know? And so this intersectoral, interdepartmental, and inter-public private and community integration is the second thing that we need to to sort of do in our, uh, if for our policies to really translate into action. Actually, the problem is not the policies, it's the, it's the it's policy in practice rather than yeah. policy in, in state. The third one, I think, is something I really hope happens, is that we as a nation need to have a national campaign not for literacy, but for numeracy. By numeracy, I mean, and we need to start with the elites. Our elites are the most enumerate people in the sense that the, when it comes to costs, they completely are illiterate. You know, we want this also, we want this also, we want this also, but the fact that someone will have to pay for it, and eventually that the government doesn't pay, it's, you know, taxpayers who pay, and you know, and if if there's not enough, then the government is, uh, you know, prone to doing having a fiscal deficit, and then that causes inflation, which then the poor pay for more than proportionately. You know, so unless we as a nation recognize that all goodies cost money, and the principle should be users pay in proportion of the usage, whether it is electricity, whether it is drinking water, whether it is school education, whether it is higher education, whether it is you know, railways, anything. User pay in proportion to usage, quality and quantity. If that principle is widely understood in society, all these silly debates about, are microfinance, mein, how can you charge 24%? And, you know, all that will vanish because if you were only numerate, can you have that discussion? If you're not numerate, I can spend my life trying to convince people that there's something called transaction cost, et cetera, et cetera. And you always come back to the new banking secretary who says, oh, but 24 is too high, isn't it, Mr. Mahajan? So, we need these three changes. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Vijay. I just loved your comment about policy making being too far, too serious to be left to governments and uh, the bureaucracy. As the old uh, line went about war being too serious a matter 
to be left to generals. Yes. So a bit of that. <laughs> it's actually a take off on that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thought as much. Yes. <laughs> we both need a little heart. <laughs> uh, Tamal, back to you. And uh, again, I think uh, we're looking at uh, Vijay's uh, observation. And uh, from your standpoint, what would you like to see as uh, the three policy interventions which you believe at this point in time are critical to ensure that uh, the financial inclusion agenda uh, really gets fast-tracked? Yeah, I think uh, one, um, Uh, I personally feel that there is a lot of hype has been happening. Uh, and that is you know, I'm asking you this and uh, which uh, hype. Mahajan Sab said, uh, uh, even for Jandan, what's new about it? We had everything else before. That no fails account and Jandan, there is not much of difference. Only thing it's packaged in a different way. Though suddenly you hear is something called jam. What is jam? One is Jandan and mobile and Aadhaar. What is new about it? Mobile, is it been discovered now? Aadhaar, has it something happened in the past three months or six months? And Jandhan is something, is a, is a new way of looking at a no-fields account. So what we are, I think the entire focus is now on packaging and call it hype or noise, et cetera, et cetera. So first thing, if we really mean this business, and there is a lot of contradiction, as I said. On the one hand, we are claiming that because of Jandhan, 90% of Indians have now been, uh, you know, uh, come under the banking fold. On the other, we are saying that uh, India should take 20 years to become fully financially included. On the one hand, we ask banks, to please give more loans to ba farmers, give loans, load them with loans. And second day, we talk about farmers' indebtedness. So there is a lot of contradiction. I think this entire issue of financial inclusion has been hijacked by the politicians and the government. The earlier government was doing in a different way. This government is doing in a different way. Had this microfinance been, I mean, you know, that the kind of hype and the kind of noise and everything that we hear, had it been, been so successful, then why after so many years we find that, I think the December numbers is some 31,450 crore. That is the collective, uh, that is the collective book size of the entire microfinance industry. Uh, NBFC microfinance. That is 90%. Uh, I mean, and the, maybe if you take everything else, maybe less than 40,000 odd crore. And if you have the self-help group also account, that will be another 95, 96,000 crores. So 1.4 trillion, something like that. So what's so big deal about it? What is so big deal about it? Had this really been doing a fantastic job, it, you should have five, six, eight trillion. Et cetera, et cetera. So clearly there are limitations what microfinance can do. There's a question of you have to depend on the bank for funds. There's a question of scaling up business. And there is a, there is a political risk that you run. So microfinance cannot be the future of financial inclusion. It has to be banking in the at It has to be banking. That is, I, I would say, the point number one, if you say. One is this point, uh, there has to be banking, and I think Reserve Bank of India has taken the right path, the small banks, that should be the future. And that, indeed, that is the future that shows that 15 of your NBFC microfinance, 15 or 18 have applied 17. for banks, 17 of the banks. So MFIN, which has become now the first um, um, SRO. SRO, what will happen to MFIN if all the 15 guys, 17 guys have been given? <laughs> your your 31,000, 32,000 book size will be reduced by 90%. What will, your, your existence will be at threat. So I think small banks is the future of, uh, that's the point number one, small bank is the future of this thing. And to do that, RBI has to be really liberal and imaginative. India does not have the history, does not have the history of bank failures. And small banks cannot be a threat to the system. Let some of the banks fail. What's the problem? You had the investor, he said that, and rightly he pointed out uh, that uh, so you guys don't know how to, you, you, you know only the one leg that is giving loans, but you don't know how to, uh, how to uh, garner deposits, so it will be, life will be very tough. Yes, life will be very tough, and let some of them die. What is the problem? But uh, you should be very liberal. You should have 50, maybe to start with 20 banks given, then in course of time make it on tap, give it, f let, let, let hundreds and thousands of small banks bloom. That's 
that's the only way because you cannot have an institution like MFI which is only depending on one leg continue to you know have money borrowed from banks and then give it to the uh, uh, poor or so called the unbanked people and then keeping a margin you will justify but the politician will say 24% or 22% very high etc etc you can only survive and remain as long as banks are inefficient so entire microfinance edifice is built on inefficiency of Indian banking system because banks do not think that poor are bankable. So the day the banks and some of the new private sector banks actually they are not routing money through microfinance, they are going directly and hitting, uh, you know, where it hits the most the microfinance in the interior of Orissa, Bihar, Assam, they are doing that. I will not name the banks. So if more and more banks do, in the, do, do that, they will be able to, uh, you know, uh, give money at a much uh, cheaper rate than microfinance guys. So I think the, the future is very clear, uh, not in the shadow banking business, it's in, in small banks and let there be let the thousand small banks bloom that is point number one point number two i think is this let you allow the public sector banks which account for 80 percent of the industry but which cannot go to the hinterland because they are always blackmailed by the by the trade unions you cannot uh, you cannot employ people at a cheaper rate that's that's the that's a bigger problem uh, a person sitting in Malabar Hill will get the same salary, which is counterpart, which is sitting in Gachurali in the interior uh, part of Maharashtra, where the cost of living is radically different. So let the public sector banks uh, have all of them should be allowed or go for a, for a subsidiary, uh, which is only for rural India. So you have a different pay scale, you have a different logistics, you have a, you have a different, uh, you don't need to, you don't need to have those kind of, you know, fancy um, technology. You just give them a handhold device, let them live in a walking bank, each of them. It's very cost effective and it can do wonders. And as long as you, uh, as long as you are uh, treating them as a separate subsidiary, there will not be case any court case which the RRBs were subjected to. Because RRBs, you know, they had a different kind of pay structure and then somebody moved court and entire thing happened in a very different way. So second thing I would think is this, uh, you have to have this, uh, let the public sector banks which have hundreds and thousands of, uh, of branches across India, which account for 80% of the industry, let them, under they understand that this could be a profit making business, but they could not, cannot go there because of the shackles of trade unions, etc. Etc. So free them to do that, and the only way to do that is to have a special rural cadre, follow the son of the soil movement, give them very low salary, different kind of logistics, different kind of technology, and it can be done only through a subsidiary route. Not on the bank, you cannot legally, you possibly cannot do that. You will be subject to various court cases and all. And third uh, thing, and which could be even the first thing, is this: let's not politicize things. I think it's, it's it's a very fancy thing to do, you know, uh, whether we understand or not uh, this financial inclusion and uh, there are ways of keeping the vote bank very happy, farmers, the previous government did it by 70,000 crore uh, famous loan waiver in 19, uh, 2008, uh, 70,000 or 65, 8,000 famous loan and the banking sector had to pay the price for it, the entire loan culture was destroyed and now we are saying a different kind of thing, yet we believe in India, psyche is this, we believe in more and more regulators and more and more refinance agencies. So let there be have one more refinance agency, let there be have one more regulator and let's make a mess of it. So politicians should follow a hands of policy to that. Let the banking system take care of it. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks, Aman. So I'm sorry? Because in the first place there is no finance, you have to refinance. <laughs> Uh, Ajay, uh, getting back to the comment you made about Ashatpur focused on Mudra, and I'm sorry you will have to be wearing the Mudra cross uh, for a while. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let me ask you this, and it's an un I know it's an unfair question, but nonetheless, uh, with the Ashatpur focus, uh, what, you know, the, it has been said as also yesterday that something like 58 million micro units are not covered by the formal financial system. How many of these 58 million do you think Mudra could connect with and ensure funding or access to finance in the next 12 months and next 24 months? <coughs> Can't answer that and won't answer that because uh, <laughs> we are, no, because I'm not the person to answer that. It could be CEO Mudra who should be your board of Mudra. 
uh, which is uh, actually as of now this is coming more on the basis of the numbers out there so so the numbers are you know uh, questioned also numbers but i think the the stark facts which are you know visible to all the players sitting here uh, we, we need not be discussing the numbers i think w what we should be looking at is what innovation is possible and definitely innovation is possible we can do new things and uh, uh, again, I, uh, you know, another thing is that uh, earlier I said about five out of 500, you know, ideas make it to uh, the final market. So uh, invariably, another thing is that 495 ideas either they get a bad name or they wait for the right day. I mean, 1941 biofuel trans esterification was done. It, it took you know 60 years for it to be mainstreamed again. So just because an idea has not worked, you sometimes you have to wait for 10 years and uh, start all over again. So whether, I mean, I could say that LAB and small finance banks, I mean, they're the same objectives. So we could have said that an idea has failed, need not be tried again. So, uh, or Mahila Bank, or any, any, any idea for that matter. I think we need not be talking about, uh, you know, uh, about what is actually going to be done, but rather what is possible to be done. I've seen an example of a bank in, in Latin America, which rode on technology, and I'm talking of not of today, I'm talking of more than 20 years back, almost 22 years back. A bank which, in, uh, you know, operated in a town, large town, 20 million population, you would understand where I'm talking about, and uh, it put more than 350 ATMs, or, uh, you know, uh, on, the, on the road dividers to so all the busy areas where the hawkers, where they could all put in their cash, they could deposit cash, and they were all issued card, they could withdraw money, and doing so for six months, there was only one building this bank had, no branches, and they could then go, I mean, first time they go to get the card issued, then they go and get a limit made on that. So till that time, they could only use their own money. And this bank at that time, when I saw, you know, some 30-odd photo slides, uh, had a base of more than 150,000 you know, hawker street vendors as members, uh, and very, very low non-performing asset book, and a balance sheet size of five billion US dollars. So, uh, you know, I think where we stand today, much more is possible. I see a deep connect. I mean, we can, we can say that these are, you know, uh, uh, when you talk of jam, that what is new about it, it's not happening. But why not ride on it? If the change is happening, why not ride on it? I mean, when was the last time you had the hope that UID would be there for all the citizens. When is it last that you had a device in the hand of everybody where a defaulter can't turn away, can't you know, run away, an ID? So, so technology, if it is enabling you, why not design programs around it? I think the task when, when the politicians or the government or the, or the bureaucrats, they, they set out goals uh, and they create a new body, at least for SIDBI, it's, it's about, you know, maybe appearing outwardly that it is just raising of pitch, mm -hmm. but it does pose a sense of urgency to act. Sure. So if we could earlier take, you know, long time to design. So so, so when I came to SIDB, we, we always had small bank, I mean, small scale financing in IDBI, but the sense of urgency which came when you were, you had SIDB was definitely much, much more. So when you start out as a, as a new entity, so I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not responding to a question, no, but, I'm, I, but I know for certain that uh, a small number would not do for us. I mean, in, in SIDB, in Mudra, we're very, very clear about that. So when you're talking about starting an organization of this size, because otherwise, this, we are not treating this as another subsidiary. For us, it is an organization which could, <laughs> if it really realizes the dream, it could subsume the parent. But it does have that kind of potential, and the market is out there, and, uh, and unless we do that, the regional disparities, the social inequities, if, if we don't do it, uh, I don't think as a society we, we, we can you know, just try and see how we're going to catch up. So past failures notwithstanding, we must try, we must try with all sincerity and, and learn from the experience. I think one thing we have learned in Sydney last five years is, look at international partners, not for the money they bring in, but for the programs, the knowledge, the experiences they bring. And uh, we, we have been, uh, you know, uh, we have been doing just that. I think uh, TRETS is one example, which is 
we are looking at replicating the, 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 the Mexican kind of thing. The other example I gave was also Mexico. So Mexico has had this you know, advantage of being very close to US, so technology flows in very, uh, you know, very quickly from there. And they've had you know, uh, the, the, the e-governance being driven uh, you know, for, for almost three decades now. So when the change is happening here, the ecosystem is building up. So I think, but it would de depend a lot. I mean, our outcome would depend a lot on uh, the pieces which are still not happening, which are around the corner, happening now or, or in the, you know, later. I think I'm, I, I can't be, you know, uh, being more direct than that, but technology, when it supports the payment system for the poor. So you bring the transaction cost down, and I think it is not unfair if uh, I may respond to Vijay Mahajan's comment about the rate of interest being discussed or such things. Well, there has to be a goal for everybody. Ah, thanks, Ajay. And yes, you're right. We need to be optimistic. We need to look ahead with, uh, with a different set of eyes. Things are changing, for sure. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, Manoj, uh, a quick 30 seconds. Is any closing comments from your side as a practitioner? Yeah, I think uh, you asked all of us what are the three, four things that we would look for. And I, I, would, I would sort of shortly put it as saying that with so many enabling legislation in place, what we really need now is stability and continuity. Just allow us to deliver on that. Just allow us to sort of mobilize the resources and sort of deliver. That's one. Second is in terms of funding, both equity and debt. I think the government and the RBI can play a big role in terms of ensuring higher funding to the sector so that we can actually scale up and sort of reach the numbers that the Malda mentioned. Collaboration, different people can do different things, uh, which, is, I mean, which is really the way to go in the future. And sort of enablers. So today when we look for people, we don't find skilled people. So if the government with its skill development plan sort of really comes forward, it will make a huge difference. This within the background of the Aadhaar card, within the background of the mobile connections we have, and the background of the GDY success, I think is a sure recipe for fantastic territory. Oh, thanks a lot. And Ganesh, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid we're really out of time, but 30 seconds. Yeah, and 30 seconds closing comments. Yeah, I can make it actually 20 because we try to be more efficient as an investor. So Manoj has said half the things I wanted to say. Uh, but I think the, the, the only highlight two points out of four I was going to make. One is I think we just need this ecosystem to respect entrepreneurs more. I think That's I've been an point. entrepreneur in 2004 for eight years. It hasn't changed in 11 years. A lot of things have changed in the country. That hasn't changed. And the same folks from corporate, from policy, from large organizations, when they transition to an entrepreneur, they realize how hard it is. That respect can actually fix a lot of things in this market. So I won't go into my other points, but that's the genesis. Uh, thanks uh, once again.